Okay. Well, Pastor will be back next Sunday. He'll be back here in the pulpit. But this morning, the message I've got, I'll tell you what, Satan has taught me tooth and nail over this. So it must be the right message for this morning. And it's about speaking up. About witnessing to God. He does love us. And we do love Him. And we do need to witness for Him. But before I get into that, remember, I guess last month was it, that Pastor uh, Tony had a message about forgiving. He talked about ten things that we need to know about forgiveness. And one of those was that when God forgives, He forgives completely. Okay? He doesn't forgive a little bit. He doesn't even remember. We can't get that far along when we forgive, but He can. And when we face, face Him in judgment time, He's going to open that book on our life. And if we've accepted Him as our Savior, if we've confessed our sins, and if we've asked Him for forgiveness, you know what? There won't be any record of those, any record of our transgressions whatsoever in that book. All that's going to be there is the things that we've done to help others and the things that we've done to build His kingdom. But there are a lot of Christians that have accepted Christ as their Savior. And they never share His promises. What do you think is going to be in their book? They've accepted Christ, asked for forgiveness. Their sins are all going to be gone. All their transgressions are going to be missing. But there's going to be a whole list of opportunities to share His Word that go unfulfilled. I don't want that in my book. I don't think you do either. I want my book to show fulfilled opportunities. Okay? Not unfulfilled ones. No blank pages. No blank pages. I guess a lot of folks are just shy or bashful. Maybe some are ashamed and they think they worry about what others are going to think if they bring God up into a conversation. Or no. But whatever the reason is, we need to get past it. And you know, we got some poster children in here today. Debbie, I don't know how many of you know it, but until a few years ago, Debbie could not be up in front of people. Debbie had such a fear, a paranoid fear, of being in front of people that uh, she couldn't hardly leave her home. She couldn't even be the matron of honor at her sister's wedding because she couldn't be in front of people. Yet look, this morning, she's up here this morning worshiping God with her voice. Am I telling her right, Debbie? Did I leave out anything? No, you weren't ashamed of God. You just couldn't get up there. Just could not get in front of people. Okay. Well, you know, He gave Debbie a voice and she's using it. He gave us a voice too and we need to use it. <clears throat> we need to speak up and be heard. And you know, Jesus brought this up. He brought it up in Luke 9, 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes into his own glory. Well, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? If we're too bashful to speak up, if we're ashamed to bring him up in front of other folks, I don't want to be there. I know you don't either. You know, when we talk about our blessings, and we do talk about the blessings, I hope, to other people, it's hard to count all the blessings that we've got here at Crosswalk Fellowship. God continually provides for all of our needs. Whether it's for a job, and we've seen that happen here. We pray for jobs and, and people have gotten jobs. Whether it's for finances, and look, look where we're at. Started out in a one room, rented out the community center one day a week. Pastor Tony had to bring everything that he everything that we needed to, for service. He had to bring it in his trunk of his car, unload it, set it up, put it back in his car. Every Sunday that look today. God's providing, He's answering our prayers. We have a mortgage. We have expenses like just like everybody else. And you know what? He provides every month. Every month. There's no end. 
to what He's willing to do for us? All we have to do, well, all we have to do is ask Him and believe in Him. Pat Parson. Pat Parson's an example of his willingness to heal. Pat had stage 4 cancer. And all the doctors could do, they reached the point where they couldn't do anything more than just make her comfortable. But after prayer, God stepped in. You know what He did? He put that cancer in remission, didn't He? He sure did. He put that cancer in remission. Today, you can see, Pat's up and around. She's raising her granddaughter. She's keeping her family up and, and going. <clears throat> that cancer's still in remission, isn't it? All right. And then another example. <clears throat> Lloyd Hadley, a few months back, was in the hospital. He'd been in there for a couple of weeks. And instead of getting better, he was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And then Sunday morning, Cheryl brought him up and lifted him up to God, prayed for him, this church prayed for him. The next morning, when I called his wife, Jean, by the way, that's my aunt. <laughs> when I called her, she recognized my voice and she said, Mike, before I could say anything, she said, Mike, you're not going to believe it. There was a miracle yesterday. Lloyd, who couldn't even get out of bed by himself, started feeling better. He got stronger and even got up and shaved himself. Two days later, Lloyd left the hospital, strong enough to leave on his own power. He's still at home, enjoying life with Jim. Now, Lloyd's 94 years old. He's not running any marathons, but he is at home. He is enjoying life with his wife. That's just a couple of examples of God answering prayer. And if you think back, I'm sure that you'll remember a time when He answered prayer. I know for yourself, a loved one, and maybe a friend. We need to share and make others aware of those manifestations because they demonstrate the reality of God. They demonstrate His presence. We need to especially share them with non-believers and those <coughs> that are following a false God or don't, don't have any God at all. They're lost souls. They're headed for an eternity in hell if somebody doesn't step up and help them. And you know what? We're part of that somebody. And again, just like He gave Debbie a voice, He gave all of us a voice. And our words can be powerful. And if you take a look at Proverbs 18.21 in the first part, He says, and I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase a little bit here because it's a long verse. The tongue has the power of life and death. Words can and do change lives. I think we probably all experienced that at some point in time. And it's becoming more important than ever for us to stand up and be heard. There are folks all around us who know about Jesus but don't really know Him. And folks who are surrendered to Satan and they're leading a life that goes nowhere. Just goes nowhere. Speak up. Don't let shyness don't let fear be a barrier to helping them find the truth. In James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, he talks about saving sinners. He says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and want to convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from error, from the error of his way, shall save a soul from death. He's talking about an eternal death, not just a one time death an eternal death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Then in 1 Chronicles 16.24, he talks about speaking up. That's what we're talking about this morning. He talks about speaking up. He says, Declare His glory among the heathen, His marvelous works among all nations. Now when he's talking about the heathen, he's talking about the unsaved, those that don't know Him. That's what he's talking about. And you know, 
some of Jesus' last words to his followers recorded in Acts 1.8. Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, he was talking to his disciples then. But you know what? If we're his disciples today, he's talking to us also. We are to witness. And if we don't take pride in our relationship with God, and if we fail to take advantage of opportunities to share His teachings, we really let Him down. Our silence, not sharing His truth, fits right in with Satan's goals. And I know, when we're here at church, and when we're with around Christian friends, we're comfortable talking about all that He does for us. And that's great. Iron does sharpen iron. <clears throat> but the folks we really need to reach are those ones that he spoke about when he talked about the heathens. Those are the people we really need to reach. You know, when Jesus shed his blood, when he shed it in the beatings that he took, he shed that blood as he drug that cross all the way to Calvary, and he shed that blood on the cross. He didn't share that blood just for you and I. He shared that blood for everyone. For sinners, non-believers, doubters. He shared it for everyone. Yet, there are people today that follow religions that worship false gods. And some that have even edited the Bible to fit their agenda. <laughs> then there's the atheist. And the agnostic folks, opportunities are all around us. They're all around us. You know, Crosswalk Fellowship is a loving church. And it's a loving church 24-7. Not a loving church Sunday morning, 10 to noon. It's a loving church 24-7. And we shouldn't be waiting for lost souls to come to us here. We need to be proactive. We need to be there when the, where they're at. <clears throat> we know we serve the only true God. And if we're going to truly serve Him, we've got to share our witness. We've got to share it with the doubter, the non-believer. And those are those, there are those out there that are misled by, by uh, people who have edited the Bible. We need to take every opportunity we get. We don't want in that book of our life. We don't want a list of all the opportunities. We want a list of all the opportunities that we've met and fulfilled. You know, we can hand out tracts. We can quote Scripture. We do. And we can set an example with our lifestyle. And that's good witness. We're all good witness. But sometimes these fall short. The problem is that all too often you hand out a track, somebody will scan it, they're being nice, but it winds up in the wastebasket without really being read. Scripture falls on polite but deaf ears. People don't really hear us, they just hear it, they think we're prophesizing. In our lifestyle, if we're living the lifestyle that Jesus wants us to live, to be seen, it's only somebody that's nice. Nothing more. Can we strengthen our witness beyond that? I don't think we can. There are a lot of things we can do. And of course, the first is always prayer. Sincere prayer, not just prayer, but sincere prayer. And that's probably the most important thing we can do if we're going to prepare ourselves uh, to witness for God. And another is found in the Scripture that we hear all the time. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what's he tell us? We need, we need to study his word. We need to trans, be not transformed, have our mind, have a solid foundation of biblical knowledge in order to, to uh, prove that what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So that we can't be confused by anybody else's testimony 
and our testimony will be truth. How can we possibly hope to open somebody else's mind or their heart if we don't have a solid foundation in biblical knowledge to guide us? So, in addition to prayer, we do need to heed Paul's advice in Romans 12 too. <clears throat> then, if you happen to know somebody in particular that needs your witness, it can be really important that you understand their background, that you know where they're coming from, understand their culture. Because in some cases, without an awareness of a person's belief system, their background and their culture, there's every possibility that you're going to alienate them. The very one that you're trying to bring to Jesus, you're going to alienate them without any possibility of helping them. For example, in some cultures, hey, everything's A-OK. -okay. Putting your thumb and your forefinger together like that, which to us, it's fine. Don't worry about it. To them, it's about the same thing as holding up your naughty middle finger. That's what it means to them. Now, if you were insulted like that, if somebody was trying to witness to you and you were insulted like that, would you really hear anything else that they had to say? I doubt it. I doubt it. And you don't want to do that. So, having that, that understanding of their culture and their background sometimes can give you a stronger witness. There are other gestures that uh, some cultures find offensive that we don't. So if, if possible, and where possible, you need to, you need to uh, make yourself aware of this person's background. And then there's another very real danger in not being well prepared. You may find that the person that you're trying to help brings questions or a witness of their own that test your faith. Most of us are aware that Jehovah's Witnesses are very well prepared to challenge our beliefs. Did you know that they do believe in God? I bet you did. But not in the Trinity? I don't know how they deal with Matthew 28, 19. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now, I believe Jehovah's Witnesses got the first part of that down pat. We can take some notes from that. Go ye, <clears throat> therefore, and teach all nations. They do that very well. We don't do it near as well as they do. And I was talking to a, uh, a young lady recently who has been studying with the Jehovah's Witness. And she did mention that when they baptize, they do baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. So I don't understand that. But they do not believe in the Trinity. Something you need to be aware of. They do believe that Jesus was resurrected. But guess what? In spirit only. That He wasn't resurrected. His body wasn't re resurrected. Wasn't resurrected. I don't know how they explained the fact that when Mary went there and the stone was aside, that there was no body left there. I don't know how they explained that how they deal with that. But they do. They believe that He was resurrected in spirit only. They also believe that there is no hell. Sinners are just annihilated. And the soul dies with the body. Some of the things that Jehovah's Witnesses believe. And they do believe a lot of what Jesus taught. And the problem is, when you mix error with truth, sometimes you give error the appearance of credibility. So you have to be aware. You have to be aware. Otherwise, it may test your faith. <clears throat> if you're going to uh, talk to a Jehovah's Witness or a Jehovah's Witness tries to evangelize you, you do need to be aware of where they're coming from. That's just a few examples there. And then the Seventh-day Adventists. Excuse me. They also believe that the soul dies with the body. I don't agree with what Jesus taught. They believe that the cross did not complete the atonement. No, I'm sorry. Ellen G. White, an Adventist prophetess, 
is the one who's teaching him that. She's, she believes that, that, that when Christ went to the cross, He didn't complete our, the atonement. That He's in heaven now completing what she calls an investigative judgment after which He'll return. Not, not in line with what Jesus taught. But if you're going to talk to a Seventh-day Adventist, you need to understand what they believe, what they're starting, where their starting point is, so you can help them. Then we come to the atheist and the agnostic. Not much difference between these two. The agnostic says, hey, maybe there is a God, maybe there's not, I don't know. The atheist says, I know, there is no God. <clears throat> I guess we all probably knew that. And these folks, they're all over the place with excuses that they use for reasons why they don't believe. One of the common claims is that Jesus was just a mythical figure. Simply folklore. That he didn't exist, and if he did, he was just a man. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to quote a little scripture here too. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-8, Paul talks about Jesus dying for our sins and how He rose on the third day. And it's verse 6 that I want to, want to talk about here. In verse 6, He notes that after that, now, He's been resurrected. After that, He's, he's been talking to His disciples. He was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part of them remain under this present. Some have fallen asleep. So, if he's writing this letter to Corinthians and he's putting in falsehoods or he's trying to create a mythical figure, these witnesses were there to back him up. That it wasn't true. That he was resurrected. <clears throat> if he tried to put in falsehoods in there, I believe somebody would have called his tickets. <clears throat> Besides that, there's a lot of archaeological evidence that backs up the biblical uh, verses about Jesus' life. Excuse me. And as for him being just a man, you know what? There's a smidgen of truth in that. He did come to us as a man. He came to us in human form. He did face the same trials and tribulations that we faced. And he overcame them. But he also walked on water, controlled the weather, healed the blind and the lame, even raised people from the dead. Not the life of someone who's just a man. Another excuse is that his followers made it all up, for whatever reason. But as Pastor Tony has pointed out several times, most folks will willingly die for a lie, will they? I doubt that anybody in here wants to die for a lie. <clears throat> you know, all but one of Jesus' disciples died harsh deaths, refusing to deny it. John is an exception. John died an old man. But before he died, he suffered being put in boiling oil. He was put in prison in the mines on Patmos. And no matter how they tortured him, he refused to deny Jesus. All of his disciples refused to deny Jesus. That just touches lightly on a couple of excuses that an atheist might use to explain why he or she doesn't believe in Jesus, believe in God. And although the atheist movement is actively trying to suppress and destroy Christianity, Islam is by far a greater threat to Christians, both here and abroad. It's the fastest growing religion on earth today. It's a very aggressive religion. I guess probably one of the reasons why it grows so fast is its use of intimidation and force to gain converts. You see this in the news. Well, every day we're, getting, we're hearing news, if you're listening to the news, about ISIS and you know, other groups that are forcing conversion to uh, their version of Islam. And it's kind of hard to understand why Islam is so different 
unless we take a look at the Koran. And it was first written by Muhammad <coughs> in Mecca. Now, you have to understand, Muhammad was a militaristic figure. And as he gained power in Mecca, he was driven out. He was attacked and driven out. And he went to Medina, where he received <coughs> a lot of new light from Allah. And it seems that all of this abrogated or abridged all the verses in the original Quran that dealt with love, peace, forgiveness. <clears throat> replaced them with verses that spoke of tolerance. I mean, sorry, replaced them with verses that, that advocated deception, revenge, and bloodshed. And we see some of that today. So there are two versions of the Koran out there. You need to be aware of that. But unlike the different versions of the Bible, which just simply use different wordings to say the same thing, sometimes you try to clarify a particular verse. The versions of the Koran, the two versions of the Koran, do not agree with each other. One does speak of peace, love. The other one speaks of Revenge, bloodshed. So if you're going to discuss God with a Muslim, you need to know where he's coming from. <clears throat> he does believe in Jesus. But he believes that Jesus was a prophet that worshipped Allah, not the Son of God. He was not the Son of God. And when it comes to relationship, <clears throat> God wants one with us, doesn't he? But he doesn't demand it. He's not making anybody in here have a relationship with Him. He offers that relationship. In uh, Revelations 3.20, God says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. God offers a relationship. He wants a relationship but he wants it based upon your love and your willingness, not based upon force and intimidation. In the Koran, in Surah 2, 193, which is the verse in the Koran, Allah instructs Muslims to fight against them until there is no dissension and the religion is for Allah. Here, he demands a relationship, even if it requires force and bloodshed. Another departure from Jesus' teaching is the concept of al -Kiki. And I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly, but I'm pretty close. And this concept is permissible for a Muslim to use deception or to lie if it promotes Islam. Okay, we and I experienced this when we were in Iran. <clears throat> not very great degree, but we did experience it. And when we ask about al we we're told that it's only sanctioned and encouraged by Allah when he preserves or advances his goals. In jihad, that's another directly from Allah. And it comes in a lot of different forms. But the use of deception and terrorism is what truly sets Islam apart from other belief systems. From what I'm saying here, and from the news reports that you probably heard on the news, you might come to the conclusion that all Muslims are terrorists. Not true. Not true at all. But all Muslims have been led to believe in a false god. They're just like all other lost souls that need help to discover the truth. They need our witness and our prayers. And we need to know what they've been taught. We need to know their culture so that we can help them overcome that. <clears throat> that just touches on a couple of the belief systems that you might come across here in Evansville. Some have been edited by the Bible, have edited the Bible, I'm sorry, to fit their vision. Others don't believe there's a God. And then some worship a false God. Remember, sincere prayer a solid foundation in biblical truth and a familiarity with other belief systems can strengthen our witness. 
So after all that, why do we share Jesus' teachings? Because we love Him. Because Scripture tells us to. And most important, because we know that He is the only way to salvation. Ultimately, what we're talking about here is a spiritual battle between life and death, between an eternity spent in heaven or one in hell. If you look at Luke 10, 2, we hear Jesus lament to His disciples. Then He saith unto His disciples, the harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. And well, we've all heard that. We have the opportunity to join that workforce. We can be one of those laborers. All we have to do is speak up for it. Let's pray. Father, with all that's happening in the world today, we need a heightened sense of urgency and concern for those that are not saved. I guess my prayer this morning is that, that you will put a, a need and a strong desire in the hearts of your followers to speak up and to help others that don't know you to experience your love and to come to accept you as their Lord and Savior. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.